Um, let me pray and then we will uh, jump in. We're in a series called Crossroads and we're looking at what decisions we make when we come to these important places in our lives. Sometimes we're aware of how important our decisions are and sometimes we're not, but as we're moving through the Gospel of Mark and into and through the Passion of Christ, we're looking at these places where singular decisions take us to places and actually shape our character if we continue on the road where our decision sort of initiates and takes us. And so, week number one, we kind of looked at the difference between what it meant to be a follower of Christ versus just someone who admires Christ, someone who's more of a fan. And then last week we looked at the whole concept of greatness. The idea that Jesus had versus his disciples. The whole me first or you first. And how that sets us on a course. And today we're going to be looking at what happens when we come to the crossroads of gratitude and complaint. Um, and how both shape you one way or the other and take you someplace. So we're going to be looking at that in just a minute. But before we do, uh, let's pray together um, and ask God just to speak to us. Lord, I feel blessed and privileged today to be here with my family and my friends. And I thank you for the way that you have been at work through our worship this morning, speaking to us along the way. And I pray that in the time remains with the teaching and communion, that there would just be something about the way that you get our attention, that you speak to us, that really helps us turn a corner or make an important decision or change us in some way that leads us to life and life more abundant. And I pray and ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever noticed how two people can look at the exact same thing and see something entirely different? This happens quite often. A couple weeks back, I don't remember exactly the day, but it was, I, I remember it very vividly because these kinds of things don't happen. It was somewhere in early March where we had a 75 degree day. You probably will remember it, whether or not you remember the exact day or not. And I was so thankful because winter is probably like my fourth favorite season. <laughs> And the idea that in early March it could be 75 degrees, I was stoked. I was so excited. And um, actually that day got on a short sleeve shirt and shorts and went for a run. Like it was really that nice. And uh, the next day I was having a conversation with somebody about, man, wasn't yesterday so great? The sun was out. It was warm. I felt the warmth on my skin. I went for a run. I just, spring is coming. And in like no time flat, they said, yeah, it was really hot. <laughs> I just thought, did we see the same thing? Did we feel, experience? Like one person saw spring coming, coming out of winter. The other person thought it was too hot. Last week after we finished here, I had a friend um, who passed away, same age as me, 52 years old. I had coached her son in Little League, and um, after 15 years of battling breast cancer, she passed away, and when I went to the funeral home, there were literally hundreds and hundreds of people who were coming and going. This lady was really beloved. She's a very special person to a lot of people, and um, it was very poignant because many of the people I hadn't seen since Little League, since my kids were small, and it had been a while, and so we were catching up and reflecting and just thinking about sort of the beauty of her life, but the tragedy of her loss at such a young age. And um, they were really rich, poignant conversations that we were having. And it just sort of put me in a certain place. I just kind of had a perspective that something like that gives you that nothing else can. And then as I was walking out, I saw another friend of mine who was there. And I began to share about some of my own reflections. and. And they just couldn't get over how bad the parking situation was at the funeral home. I mean, there were, there were like hundreds of people. So rather than seeing like this outpouring, they saw inconvenience. And I was thinking to myself, as I passed her laying in a box, like if we had to walk 10 miles, like 
when it was over, I would go back to my family and my wife and my kids, and, but they couldn't see it. We were looking at the exact same thing. And all they saw was the inconvenience. And I just thought to myself, how, how is that? That we could be looking at the same thing and that we would be touched by it. We, we both loved her deeply. I mean, we were both very grateful to know her and sat at her loss. But somehow the lens through which we were looking was different. And I think this happens a lot. I think it happens um, all the time. And the story that I want to unpack for you uh, this morning, Cornell read it earlier, um, comes from Mark chapter 14. It's the story during the final week of Jesus' life where he is having a meal. And the town that they are in is called the town of Bethany. It's just two miles outside of Jerusalem. There's a lot of coming and going in the final week of Jesus' life. Jesus, during the day, will go into Jerusalem. He will teach. He will be there. But in the evenings, he will leave, and he will oftentimes go out of town. And one of the houses that he stays in happens to be in this little town called Bethany. And so when they arrive in this place, Jesus is having a meal at the home of Simon the leper. Now Simon was a friend of his along the way that he had cured of leprosy and he had befriended him and they had a relationship. And also at that dinner were his disciples, his twelve, and then also some other friends of his, uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus and, and probably some others that we don't have their names. But um, what I want to talk about this morning is how in the midst of preparing during this final week of his life, in the midst of preparing him for what was to come, at this very special dinner there was one person who saw one thing and a whole group of others who saw something entirely different. Not all that dissimilar from what I had just finished telling you. So let me read just a portion. Some of you guys weren't here when Cornell had read it, but let me just reread a portion of it. So this is in Mark chapter 14. While he was eating, Jesus, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. And she broke open the jar and she poured the perfume over his head. Now this is what we would call awkward. They're in the middle of a meal. They are enjoying their time together. And in bursts this woman with what is this expensive vase of imported perfume. Nard, a lot of the theologians and those who know more about it than I do, say that this perfume was imported from India. And they placed the expense, some of them, at $30,000. So in that day, that's quite a bit of money. In this day, $30,000 for perfume is pretty expensive. So she burst in, she breaks the vase, she dumps the contents over his head. And when you're reading this story, unless you've become too familiar with it, you have to ask yourself the question, why would she do such a thing? I mean, just think about the next time you have a meal and you're gathered with your family and your friends and you're spending this special time. Imagine if someone burst into your home, came, broke open the contents of the most expensive thing they had. They said, many of the scholars and theologians say that this represented her entire life savings. And she dumped the contents over his head. Why would she do such a thing? There are two reasons that I can think that she would. Number one, if you've not been with us for the last two weeks, what I've been telling you in the passages we've been looking at is Jesus is trying to tell his disciples what's getting ready to happen. And that is that he's going to die. Now in week number one, Peter wanted nothing to do with it. In fact, he rebuked him. And that's when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Your desires and my desires, your plans and my plans are not the same. In the second week, where he told them again that he was going to die and three days later be raised, they decided to have a side conversation about which one of them was the greatest. They're not listening. They don't hear what's happening. Apparently, the only person who realized what was going on is this lady. Now, in this story, in the Gospel of Mark, it doesn't tell you her name. But if you were to read the exact same story in the Gospel of John, it would tell you that this is Mary. Not Mary, Jesus' mother, not Mary Magdalene. This is Mary, who has a sister whose name is Martha, and who has a brother whose name is Lazarus. Two reasons. Number one, 
She pours out the entire contents of her whole life savings because she realizes that what Jesus is telling her and has been telling his disciples is true. At the end of the week, he's going to die. And because she is so grateful for what he has done in her life and in the life of her family members, she gives everything she has to honor his life and his death. Now, let me ask you, her brother is Lazarus. Does anybody remember the story of what Jesus did for her brother? He raised her brother from the dead. Her brother, like my friend last week in the funeral home, laid out in a box, dead. Jesus comes, speaks words of life, raises him from the dead. Let me ask you the question. If someone raised your brother or someone you loved very dearly from the dead, what would you not give? I would give anything to have my brother back. I would give everything to have my brother back. So she's heard what Jesus has said. I'm getting ready to go. I'm going to die. I'm going to die a violent death. But three days later I will return. So she's preparing him for burial. But her generosity, her extravagance, it comes from a place of gratitude for what he has done for her brother and what he has done for her sister and what he has done for her. He has changed their lives. And she can't give enough. And so it's a bit awkward and it's kind of out of place, but it's the best she has. And she comes and she dumps it entirely over his head. Now think about a huge alabaster vase full of perfume. I would imagine that anybody in his vicinity over the next several days would have been getting a whiff of that, wouldn't you? I mean, that's a lot of perfume to drench him in. Sometimes just a spray or two is more than enough if you've been in the presence of people with strong, like, colognes or perfumes. It's like his hair is wet, his body is drenched. And so she's grateful. And her generosity is the fruit of her gratitude. But there are another group of people who are at the exact same dinner, seeing the exact same thing, having heard the exact same stories, who aren't really looking at it in the same way. These are the people who were actually closest to him, who'd been living with, walking with, sharing life with for three years. Listen to what it says their response is. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages been given to the poor and so they scolded her harshly now I want you to just put your thinking caps on for a second Mary is grateful she's preparing her Lord for burial she's giving all that she has because of all he has given to her now these disciples who have seen Jesus at work in incredible ways over the course of three years, they've been chosen to be his closest friends. When they see this act, they're upset with this woman. Why in the world would they be upset with someone who from gratitude is expressing great generosity towards someone that they love? Why would they be so upset? I want you to think about that. Because you have two people looking at the exact same thing. One person sees it one way, another group sees it differently. Now, again, in the Gospel of John, it doesn't tell you that here, but in the Gospel of John, it tells you that Judas is leading the charge of dis discontent. Why is Judas upset that Mary is... It's not like Mary gave his perfume. It's not his it's hers so why would he be upset with her now there's a variety of reasons that this could be but here's what I think I think Judas isn't getting his way I think Judas wanted Jesus to be the new Moses and to deliver he, his friends and fellow countrymen from the slavery that they had been under from the Roman Empire I think they wanted a different kind of Messiah. But Jesus wasn't going to be a new Moses for him. Jesus was going to take the part in this larger Passover meal as what? 
He was going to be the Passover lamb. He was going to sacrifice his life on their behalf. He was going to be one who suffered on their behalf so that they could be freed from their spiritual bondage. They couldn't see it. They couldn't know it. They didn't appreciate it. I think Judas was angry because he wasn't getting what he wanted. Which leads me to the question, how do you deal with life when you don't get your way? What is your response when faced with difficult situations that aren't turning out the way you wanted them to? Is the road you travel one of gratitude or one of complaint? Because as you can see from Mary's response, her gratitude resulted in generosity. But Judas's complaint resulted in treachery. And listen to what Jesus says as the story sort of draws to a close. Jesus says, She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth that wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. There are only a handful of stories that are mentioned in all four Gospels. This is one of them. This story of this woman breaking a vase and pouring out the entire contents on Jesus' head, the birth of Christ isn't even mentioned in all four Gospels. There's a handful of stories, and this is one of them, and Jesus says, stop it. Leave her alone. What she has done, she will be remembered for. And we're now, thousands of years later, talking about this lady who did such a great thing, right? She, she will be remembered for years for doing this. She's remembered for her gratitude and her generosity. But then, how does the grumbling, complaining Judas play his story out? Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priest. So the meal ends. He rushes out of the house. He's so ticked off. He then goes to the house of one of the leading priests to arrange to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted when they heard why he had come, and they promised to give him money. So he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Do you see how when you come to the crossroads of a place where you make a decision that it will take you someplace? Later he would regret this. And he would actually take his own life. He couldn't live with himself that he had done such a terrible thing to somebody that he really loved. He loved Jesus. But he was so caught up in his discontent and his grumbling that his heart actually became hardened to the person who had given everything for him. And you see, that, that's really what happens when we come to these spaces where we make these decisions, the lens that we look through ultimately will determine what we see. I've been learning a whole lot about this. I've been on a journey this year um, where God has been teaching me a whole lot about happiness and about gratitude. Literally, I'm, my life is changing. I'm 52 years old and I'm learning stuff like this year that I've never, ever learned in my entire life. You know, for the better part of my Christian life, there were, there were evidences of God's uh, Spirit birthing really rich fruits in my life. Things that, I, that I'm grateful that resembled the gift that He was offering me. I can remember a time where I wasn't so patient. I've seen the fruit of patience grow in my life. Where I had a hard time with self-control and I've seen that grow in my life. I've seen tenderness and kindness and love. I've seen God at work in my life growing things. And when I look back at my life, I'm, I'm astonished sometimes. I feel like I've lived two or three or four different lives when I look at where I am and who I am now versus five years or ten years or fifteen years. I think God is very faithful if we are committed to being followers of His Son, to working out His goodness in our lives. But the one thing that has always escaped me is this idea 
of being happy or having joy in my life. I honestly, I've never really been a happy person. And it's not that I'm a depressed or sad person, but it's just that in my life, I've always thought about what's next. I never have really been happy because I've always focused on success, meaning arriving at a certain place. But the problem with doing that is when you arrive at that place, you then recast the next place. You hardly have a chance to appreciate what brought you there and that you are there. All you really think about is the next thing and the next and the next. And so I've been learning some amazing things that in life, and they, they've done a lot of research on this. They're, I've been reading this stuff from a guy by the name of Sean Acor. He's a, he's a positive psychologist, and he's from Harvard, and they've done a lot of testing about what makes for a happy life, what makes for a joyful life. And he said, most of us think that if we get that job, if we get that relationship, if we acquire that title, if we get that money, if we get whatever, if we acquire or accumulate whatever it is that we think will make us successful, then we'll be happy. And he said the research bears out time and time again that only 10% of our happiness comes from the things that we achieve or acquire or become. 10%. He said, but all of the other research shows us that 90% of our happiness, 90% of the joy that we live with, comes through the lens through which we look at the world. And he said, how we look at the world determines the reality in which we live in. That's why, globally, as they do these studies, people who live in abject poverty can have happiness in their life, not because their circumstances or situations are what they want them to be, but because when they look at something, they see something entirely different. And what he goes on to say is, and he wrote this incredible book, I'm going to actually like teach a class on it in a couple of months, about the happiness experiment. What he said is, you have the capacity by the decisions, by the choices, by the practices you make to actually change the patterns in your brain. So you can go from being a cynical, grumpy, negative person to actually, over a period of time, if you give yourself to a variety of practices, which he outlines, you have the capacity to actually change the way in which you see the world. So he says, when you look at the idea of happiness, it's not about pursuing happiness, it's about creating it. And so there are things, and one of those things, one of those practices is something that I've been doing for the last six months. Every morning when I wake up, I sit on my sofa and I read a devotional for about five to ten minutes. It's just a small devotional. It's not, I don't sit there for an hour. I just take five or ten minutes. I reflect on a scripture and what the author has to say. And after that, I pick up my journal, and I think I told some of you guys this. I had read a book six months ago where a lady was challenged to write down three things every day that she was grateful for until she got to a thousand, right? And it, the book is called A Thousand Gifts. So like now I'm in the high 780s, right? I'm, where I am now is I have every day been doing this for six months. And some days it's three, some days it's more, but it's never less than three. And every day when I wake up, what I do is I review my previous day. I just look at the last 24 hours. And I just sit quietly for five to ten minutes. That's all it really takes. And I reflect back at all of the ways in which my day was gifted, was blessed, had good things. And what it's done for me is this. Now, when I look at my days and I move from that place of writing down the gratitudes and entering my day, I'm looking for good things to happen. Whereas sometimes, let's say I got in bed late, I didn't get enough sleep, I'm rushing, I go into my day thinking, oh, I don't have very much energy, or yesterday was just a terrible day, and I have to like summon it from some place. I'm looking for bad things to happen to continue what was previous. But now, when I look at my day, I actually am expecting good things to happen. And so what you look for, you find. What you focus on grows. So here's the deal. Two people 
saw the same situation. One responded with gratitude and generosity, the other responded with complaint and treachery. One person's heart was open wide, the other person's heart was closed and hard. How did they get to that place? Both of them knew and loved Jesus well. They had been with him for three years. How does that happen? How can we be Christians and one of us have a heart that's open and wide and generous and the other person negative and closed and hard? The thing is, it's not that I can't acknowledge that there are difficult, bad things in my personal world. I acknowledge those, but I don't fixate on them. I don't dwell on them. I don't expect when something bad happens, I don't look for the next bad thing. I'm looking for how God can turn it around, how God can take a bad situation and redeem it. It's just the way that I'm looking at my world, and I have to tell you, like, I'm changing. Like, at 52 years old, I am changing, and I've never been happier. I feel like such gratitude in my heart. It has eluded me for my entire life. I just feel blessed. And bottom line is, it's not just me, like that can be you. And I love how faith and science are working together on this, like the more that I'm reading and studying, I'm just realizing that like the research bears out that, that like literally you can change the way that you think. But that's what the authors of the scriptures have been telling us for so long, right? That transformation from the inside out begins by the renewing of our minds. It's by what we think about. These things think on that which is good and true and right and noble and beautiful. And what? And the God of peace will be with you. So I don't know, if you want to be happier, if you want to have joy in your life. Now this guy, Sean Acor, he goes on to give five practices, which I've talked about. I'll tell you more when we when I do the class on it. Five practices, but one of the most significant is the gratitude. Maybe you can start there. Sometimes when I give you like things that I'm learning, I, I think maybe I gave too much. You know, I was too excited, I gave too much. Maybe we should just start with that. What if tomorrow, when you woke up, you sat down for five minutes, and you found a notepad, and you just thought until you could come up with three things? See, that part's not hard. The hard part is doing it the next day, and the next day, and the next day. But you know what's happened somewhere in the six-month process for me? It's not hard anymore. Like, I, when I start my day, I can't wait to start my day. Why? Because it, it sets a tone for how the rest of my day is going to be. And so now, not only do I get the low-hanging fruit, sometimes when you review your day, it's easy to find some good stuff, right? On your birthday, when people say nice things about you, it's easy to write those things down. But now what's happening is you not only get the low-hanging fruit, the more it becomes a discipline is, you start to, in the very small things, see the benefit, the blessing, the good. Now, graduate level living is when you have something bad happen and you can see the good in that. That's where I'm working towards, right? So I just want to say to you, like, Mary is remembered thousands of years later because she was grateful and her gratitude led to generosity. Judas, just as close to Jesus, is remembered for his treachery, which was the fruit of his complaint. And so we come to this crossroads every day when we decide what we're going to do when something doesn't go our way. That's why I asked you the question, when things don't go your way, what road are you going to travel down? What path are you going to choose? It really is a choice. You say, it's not really, it doesn't feel like a choice to me. It's very reflect, reflexive. Yeah, because it's just become a habit. That's all. But you can change your habit. You can change the way your mind thinks. I'm, that's happening to me. I'm telling you that. So I, I just close by asking you, like, what do you want to be remembered for? Like your story's being written. What do you want to be remembered for? I think complaint focuses on what's wrong. But gratitude focuses on what a gift life is and how brief 
we have to enjoy it. When I think about the idea of gratitude and complaint, you know, complaint pushes out gratitude. When you, when you create space in your life for complaint to come and live, it pushes gratitude to the margins. But you know the opposite is true. Gratitude pushes complaint out too. It just makes sense, right? The more room you make for something in your life, the more it occupies that space. And so, I'm not saying it works perfectly every day for me. What I'm saying is it's just become easier for me to see what a gift life is and to treat it as that. And if you don't believe me, which I know most of you probably believe me, but if you don't believe me, you can just ask my wife and you can ask my kids, is he happier? Honestly, is he ha do you see that he's happier? Just ask them. And then I trust that they'll tell you exactly what I'm telling you. Why? Because when you're happier, the people around you are happier. It's just how it goes. But when you're not, everybody else around you feels it. They do. And so what do you want to be remembered for? That's really what I want to say. Now, that being said, we're going to take communion. We're going to finish with communion today. I thought it's appropriate because as you read this text, if you finish out chapter 14, you go from Tuesday night to Wednesday, where not, not a lot is happening on Wednesday, but then you get to Thursday, which is what we call Monday Thursday. We'll celebrate that during Holy Week. Um, but this is when they go to another dinner. This dinner is in Jerusalem. And Jesus is once again telling them, um, he's telling them about how Judas is going to betray him. And he's telling the rest of them that when it, when the heat is turned up, that they're actually going to leave him when he needs them the most. They're going to deny that they actually even know him. He's like, he's telling them these hard things. And yet he says, but even though all of that's going to happen, I really am glad you're here. And I really want to share this meal with you. So think about that. You're hanging with your friends who are going to betray and deny and leave you when you most need them, but you're really glad they're there. That's, that's graduate level, right? So just before we, we come and receive communion, I, I want to read to you this passage that comes out of Mark 14. Mark 14, verse 22. This is Thursday night of the same week. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. And then he broke it in pieces, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, for this is my body. And then he took a cup of wine, and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. Does anybody notice at all what he does when he's breaking the bread and he's pouring the cup? Does he, do you notice what he does? He gives thanks. His close friend is going to betray him. The rest of them are going to deny him. They're going to say that they don't even know who he, who he is. When he most needs them, they're not going to be there. This is one of the darkest days of his life. This may equally be as dark as the day when he's nailed to a tree and crucified. I don't know which one's more painful, the physical torment or the emotional. But you have to know this has taken a toll on him, to know that the people he's invested his entire life in for the last three years are going to just abandon him. And he's taking the bread and he's breaking it and he's telling them, this is my body. This is getting ready to happen. And he's pouring the wine and he says, this is my blood. It's all going to be poured out for you. And he's giving thanks. And that's not lost on me somehow as I read the story, especially coming out of the dinner on Tuesday. He has gratitude. Why? Because the lens through which he is looking at his life is that as a gift. And he is thankful for every moment, even though those moments are drawing to a close. It's how he sees life. And it's really what I pray will happen for us when we come this morning. I pray that as you receive the bread, 
and then you dip it in the cup? That something similar like the scales falling from your eyes would help you to see why your life is so precious and so valuable, but so fleeting. God knows how much time each of us have. Quite frankly, I was not expecting my friend to pass at age 52. But life is precious and brief. And I know that all of us have things we're working on and working through and sometimes struggling with. But I want to just encourage you to consider what a privilege it is to even be in the struggle. You have life and breath. You have great possibility in front of you, even if you have numerous obstacles blocking the way. And what I think you will find as you begin to look through the lens of gratitude is that even if stuff is difficult and hard and painful, that you have a lot of reason to be happy. And I hope as you begin to see it that it serves as sort of a counterbalance to the sadness and the struggle and the pain. Because we're not denying that life isn't difficult sometimes. We're just choosing to look through a lens that sees life as precious and valuable. So in just a moment, I'm going to invite some people up who are going to help me serve you. If you've never been here before, the way it works is that you will come when you're ready. Um, there will be two people here. Uh, there will be two people here, one who is holding a tray and one who is holding a cup. There will be another person in the middle. This, this day, it's matzah for everyone. We are, sometimes we have both gluten-free matzah and then regular bread. It's all gluten-free today. So that's the way it's going to be. In our cups, it's grape juice. So those of you who have issues with alcohol, this is not a stumbling block, a problem for you. It's grape juice. Um, and so when you come, you're going to take the bread and you're going to dip it in the cup, you're going to eat it, and then you're going to return to your seat. What you're doing when you're coming is you're receiving the gift of life that Christ offers to you. You're receiving the gift of sight that Christ wants to offer you today. You're receiving His life for yours. And as you began to receive of His gifts, my prayer is that your eyes would be opened and that you could see just how precious your life is, just how valuable it is. Some of you have not been feeling that, but I hope today your eyes are open and you see it. I hope you feel it today. And I hope it's the beginning for you of as you stand at the crossroads determining which direction you're going to go. Because our direction shapes our destination, but it also shapes our character along the way. So when I ask people, where is it that you want to go? Maybe the more important question is, who is it that you want to become along the way as you travel? Who do you want to be? Your decision at this crossroads will shape exactly who you will become and the fruits that are born from your choices. So let me pray over these elements. And I want to say to you, if you've never received communion before, if this is your first time here, or you've been here but you've not received before, communion is offered to you not based on your merit, not based on how good you are. It's based on your willingness to receive that which Christ offers to us all. What qualifies you is that you're broken. What qualifies you is that you have stuff in your life that you wished were different than what it is. What qualifies you is actually your sinfulness. And so you only come because you want to receive the gift of redemption, of new life, of hope, of the life that Christ offers. So, if you've not been before, I welcome you to come to the table. If you're not yet ready for that, if it's just you're not yet sure that that's something you want to do, then I just invite you just to think about what you've heard today. And just quietly reflect on that. And when you come, those of you who do,
you'll come and receive. And then I want you to return to your seats quietly and just honor the process that others are going through. Because if what happens today that I hope will happen today, some people's lives will be different. They will see differently when they leave here. They will hear differently. They will feel differently. They will be on a new path. That's my hope. And so I'm going to pray that that happens. So I'm going to pray. Then I'm going to invite five people to come. I'm going to serve them. And then they're going to serve you when you're ready. Okay? Join me as we pray. Father, we thank you for uh, just a wonderful story that teaches us so much. We thank you that when we think differently, we see differently. And so as we examine our lives, we ask that in these final moments, if you haven't yet spoken to us, that you would, that we would encounter you in some real way and that it would change something about the way that we look at our lives and that we live our lives from this point on. In Christ we pray. Amen.